Uh, we are on the balcony. This is what used to be called uh, the guest balcony overlooking the podium right behind me where they ring the opening and closing bells. My 22nd year here at the New York Stock Exchange and of course great honor and privilege to be down here. Uh, this is a very interesting week because we've had an amazing run to start the year. We had a horrible December as you all know and uh, a real turnaround beginning essentially the bottom was December 24th. But we're in a very, I would say, difficult position right now uh, for the markets, despite the nice turnaround and the good start to the year. So here's the main concern that's out there. Global growth is slowing. We had some comments this week from the European Union and the Bank of England that basically lowered the growth expectations for Europe rather notably in 2019. And in the case of Italy, it's essentially going to be zero growth. Okay, now remember, they've kept interest rates fairly low. There's not a lot of room for them to cut interest rates at this point because the European Central Bank has essentially been stimulating the economy. Not a great sign. European equities have not been doing that well. We also know, of course, about China slowing down. Partly this is on the tariff issue, but partly it's just the Chinese economy is slowing down. The Chinese have been engaging in various forms of stimulus uh, in different times uh, over many years, frankly. There is, uh, depending on who you talk to, some indication that there's way too much debt in China, as some people will argue there was here 10 years ago, uh, and that China just has to slow down because it has a lot of debt right now. But regardless, Europe and China slowing down is a very significant part of the global economy. Essentially, this leaves the United States as the really only notable engine of global growth out there. That puts a lot of pressure on us. Remember, roughly, roughly 40% of the earnings of the S&P 500 happen outside of the United States. So if you buy the S&P 500, you might say, oh, I don't in invest in international funds. If you own the S&P 500, you do invest internationally by definition, just by the way the earnings are divided up around the world. So my point is this puts a lot of pressure on the United States to keep global growth going if we stop if we go to zero, the global economy will certainly go into some kind of recession. That's the first concern the market has. The second concern, that is the United States keep going, the second concern is on trade. The United States, traders believe that there's going to be a trade deal. It's not completely priced in, but I will tell you, you will notice immediately if there's no trade deal, the market will definitely drop. The problem is, this is a really complicated subject. It's a lot more difficult than just, let's go buy some soybeans. No, no, no. We're talking about much more complex negotiations. The Trump administration has made it more complex. And I think most people feel rightfully so, because they're trying to address much more complicated issues around technology theft, for example, and frankly, even confronting China in general about uh, their efforts to, glom to dominate certain global industries. So. That is a really hard topic to deal with. Uh, the president has imposed a self-imposed deadline on March 1st to have a deal. It's a tall order to pull off. Again, much bigger than just them buying soybeans. So there is a lot of expectations built in that some kind of deal can be reached. That's the second risk. The third risk that we have is earnings slowing down in general. And I remember earnings partly account for global growth, but we were expecting 10% earnings growth in 2019, back in October, we we're essentially down to about 4% earnings growth for the full year. And the expectations for this first quarter is just gone negative to minus 0.1%. Okay, it's pretty small, but you get the point. The trend has been down uh, on earnings. If you believe that there will be 0% earnings growth in the S&P 500 this year, the market is very expensive. It's almost, not quite, 17 times forward earnings. Now, you don't know anything about P.E. multiples. Historically, the S&P trades you know, somewhere around 15 times forward earnings. Forward is the, the year ahead in front of you, the year in front of you, not the stuff that happened behind. And typically, you'll get 6 7% earnings growth. If you're dealing with 0% earnings growth, 17 times forward earnings, that is a very, very expensive multiple to pay. That implies the market is pricey, overbought, whatever you want to call it but it's very difficult. Also remember, most strategists still have earnings as uh, full year targets in the S&P, 2,800, 2,900, and we're around 2,700 now. So they're expecting the S&P to move up a few more percent on top of that. If there's no earnings growth at all, that would make the market even more pricey. You see my point? There's a lot of pressure here on the market. It's not cheap. There's 
slower global growth, and there's a lot of uncertainty about trade prospects. And now you see the market is not freaked out about this yet, but it's clearly getting a little concerned. You can see we've been moving sideways for several days as the market is looking for a reason to move forward and can't find it right now. What else do we want to talk about? Uh, yeah, building off of earnings, which industries have we seen the most surprises from this season? Uh, which industries have we seen the most surprises? So the big surprise has been a number of industries have talked about higher costs and margin pressures. Uh, and some have talked about price problems, uh, problems with pricing overall. Uh, so, for example, uh, a number of industrials uh, have complained about higher uh, raw material costs. Uh, in some cases, you can raise prices, and in some cases, uh, you can't. Uh, we had several examples today. Uh, I'll give you one. Mohawk. Mohawk makes uh, flooring uh, around the United States and internationally. About 40% of their business is outside the United States. They had earnings today, and the stock was hit badly last year as we saw the housing uh, the concerns about slowing housing really eat into their, into their, uh, into their price of their stock was essentially cut in half. What they came out today and said was, we are seeing significant increases in the cost of our raw materials, plastics, and they make uh, a lot of vinyl flooring, for example. And we are attempting to raise prices, but it's not happening fast enough. Essentially, that's what you call margin erosion. We, we're, costs are going up, we can't raise prices enough, so our margins are getting their margins are getting squeezed a bit. That's a problem. They also talked about the stronger dollar overseas affecting them because they have to bring the profits back here, and they're smaller if you have a strong dollar coming back. So this is a sort of microcosm, my point is, of some of the concerns that are out there. Higher costs, attempts to raise prices, but it's hard to just do that directly. Some have pricing power and some don't. And in some cases, when you're selling stuff overseas, uh, a strong dollar. So there's a, a, a microcosm. Another good example you want to see is semiconductors. Um, semiconductors are not just facing higher costs, they're facing pricing pressure. So all over the world there's competitors and that's just, there is pressure to keep the prices down. They can't raise any prices. They in fact are lowering prices and that's putting pressure on people's margin. This by the way is not bad news if you're a consumer. It means the cost of your PC is not as high as it may normally uh, would be, but it puts a lot of pressure uh, on these companies. So again, think cost pressure, uh, some difficulty raising prices, some concerns about the stronger dollar, that's sort of major uh, earnings themes that we're seeing this, se this, season, this season. Excuse me. Anna, what's next? Awesome. Another earnings question. You wrote about, um, I'm sorry, where is this? Revenue estimates. Uh, why have they really changed this? Revenues have been strong because the U.S. economy, for the most part, the U.S. economy has been strong. And this is one of those strange things. Earnings are coming down, but revenues are not coming down that much. And that's, that's good news. Um, and yet, when you see revenues holding up, and then you go, that's the top line, and then you go to the bottom line, and the earnings are not, that's a problem. That means something is happening between that top line and the bottom line. And as I said, that's something for a very large part, a uh, very large part of the problem is costs are going up, and that's eating into the profits. Not just, by the way, raw material costs. We're even seeing labor costs go up. I mean, these, this efforts to go to $15 an hour, for example, which I support. I think it's a, uh, I, I want to see people make more money. Uh, I want more money in people's pockets. Uh, but that does come at the cost of, of profits for the for the companies themselves. So uh, keep an eye on the revenue figures, but that hasn't been the problem so far. Turn and yeah. decide not to raise rates. Yeah. How does that motivate? Yeah, so there's a question about the Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, it's very funny. Jay Powell was excoriated a few months ago for his comment that we have a ways to go before we hit neutral on the Federal Reserve uh, levels and implying that there were going to be more rate hikes in 2019. That was in October 3rd, and the market had a little bit of a hissy fit about that. Now, uh, the Fed has become very, you might call it, accommodative to the market. Basically, the Federal Reserve has said, well, we're very data dependent, uh, and we are going to wait to see what the data tells us. And the implication is, it's unlikely you're going to see rate hikes this year. You're certainly not going to see several. So the market likes that, of course. Uh, and there is uh, a lot of debate about this. So Powell and the Fed were excoriated for sounding too hawkish, like they were going to raise rates too much in 2019. Now they're getting excoriated for sounding like they're too dovish, like they're not going to do any rate hikes. You can't win when you're the Federal Reserve. Essentially, you're always critical. But the point is, 
the market obviously um, has some kind of influence on the way uh, the Federal Reserve uh, is thinking. And there's one of the real positives for the stock market. And one of the reasons the market is, is holding up so well, you might say, well, gee, if you're all worried about slowing global growth, why aren't we, why aren't we uh, uh, down more? And part of it is because the U.S. economy is doing well. And um, at least here in this part of the universe, uh, the profit picture is holding up. It's overseas where you had a little bit of a problem. We got one more question? Yeah, uh, BB&T and SunTrust combining this uh, yeah. week. What does this mean for the banking industry? Yeah, so BB&T and SunTrust, these are two big uh, banks in the in the Southwest, essentially have big pr footprints in the Midwest and the Southwest, uh, merged this week. We haven't seen any bank mergers in a long time, but there's a good reason for bank mergers. First, there's too many banks. But secondly, it's really hard to get any growth these days in the banking business. I mean, if you have to think about it uh, this way, uh, interest rates aren't going up that much. Uh, so it, the amount of profit a bank can make uh, between what they pay out in your deposit and what they're lending out in loans is not dramatically increasing. So what's called the net interest income, how much they can make from interests, interest rates, is not that great. The other thing is loan growth, like just giving loans, consumer loans and commercial loans and real estate loans. It's been going up. But it's not been gangbusters. It's one of the strange things. We've had a very good economy. The U.S. economy is strong. But loan growth has not been particularly great. There's been a lot of debate about this, but let me just leave it at that. You know, 1% or 2%, that's what you kind of see in dollar terms. So loan growth, kind of anemic, and interest income from these banks, kind of anemic. Uh, deposit growth is kind of anemic as well. So the, the banks have got a problem. You know, everybody's going online. You know, you all have an app, right, to make bank, to, to, you know, deposit checks into your bank. A lot of you probably just use apps to do that. You don't go to the bank anymore. Um, you want to uh, move some money around, you use uh, an app uh, to do that. The banks are investing enormous, hundreds of millions of dollars in online, in moving all their customers online. This is a huge cost to them with not a lot of payback immediately. So think about this. The ability to grow their income, their top kind, is getting limited. They have huge costs to go into uh, online, and that's really hurting them. So once you do this online thing, you can scale it up. If you have 10 million customers, it doesn't cost you much more to have 20 million customers when you've got everything in a digital realm. That's why they're doing this. So you, scale, you spend a, sh a bunch of money to eventually have all your customers be digital, and it costs you a ton. But once you have it, you can throw in a lot of people. It doesn't cost you anymore to get new customers into the system if you can get them. So one way to get them is merge. And that's what's going on here. You're going to see more of this going forward. That's the important thing. Expect more bank mergers, and there's going to be a differentiation. Those who are bigger are scalable. They have the ability to offer more differentiated products, more innovation. And then you're going to have the others, the also rands, that are not so big and can't offer more innovation. And they're going to be the targets. They're going to be the ones who are going to get acquired. It's a very interesting uh, business uh, to watch right now. But the word fintech, financial technology, you doing stuff on your apps, you doing stuff, it, that's what's changing uh, the banking industry. That's it for this week. Bob Pisani down here on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Everybody have a happy, healthy, and safe weekend. Okay. Thank you so much. Nice. Nice. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you.